So our next speaker is the co-director for the conference, uh, Dr. Robert Wong, who is also an assistant professor uh, and gastroenterologist here at Stanford. He's going to talk about gastric intestinal metaplasia. Robert. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's so great to see old friends, new friends, faces in the audience. Thank you all for coming again to now our third Gastric Cancer Summit. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about gastric intestinal metaplasia as a precursor to cancer. <clears throat> so this is a representation of uh, the slide that Dr. Parsonet just pre uh, presented. This is the hypothesis presented uh, many years ago by Paleo Coria. <clears throat> and so in this cascade, some, in some inflammatory insult in many parts of the world, H. pylori, more and more in the United States now autoimmunity leads to a cascade of changes of the gastric uh, mucosa which go from chronic gastritis to atrophy to intestinal metaplasia to dysplasia and ultimately to cancer. <clears throat> so today I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about this lesion, intestinal metaplasia. So you might wonder why pick among all of these potential lesions along Corius cascade intestinal metaplasia to study and why is it so tempting a target for cancer prevention? Well, I think that this is for several reasons which some of our speakers today have already touched upon. The first that, that is that this lesion is very readily detectable by endoscopy if you know how to look. And that's something that Dr. Shaw had mentioned already to, uh, today, the importance of training Western endoscopists, specifically American endoscopists, on the detection of this lesion. The second reason, I think, is that there is less intra-observer variability when assessing IM histologically compared to atrophic gastritis and other lesions. Now, this is a topic that <clears throat> some other people in this room, especially Dr. Piazuelo, knows a lot more about, and I'm very excited to hear her talk about this. And finally, I think there's starting to be more and more evidence that this, is an, this in some ways is an immutable lesion, that it is less likely to resolve following eradication of Helicobacter pylori in comparison to, say, atrophy. And, and we are starting to have now good cohort data from uh, Korea that this is the case. I think there's, there's now some modeling data to suggest that intestinal metaplasia doesn't really resolve after helicobacter pylori treatment. And so this really emphasizes the need for clinical risk stratification tools and potentially biomarker-based risk stratification tools. For the gastroenterologists in the room, most of the intestinal metaplasia that we are going to be seeing and that we are going to be surveying are going to be in H. pylori negative patients. That's just the way it is in the West. Moreover, it's going to be treated by, the, by your referring physician. So we need better ways to deal with H. pylori negative intestinal metaplasia. So that's going to be the topic of my talk today. So <clears throat> first I wanted to um, briefly discuss Im imaging-based features. Uh, sorry that the slide got slightly cut off here. Um, so the importance of virtual chromoendoscopy, if you're using the Olympus system, the narrow, uh, narrow band imaging. And so there were a couple of studies published about 10 years ago by Pimentel Nunez et al., uh, which really demonstrated the um, wonderful performance characteristics of certain features on NBI to detect intestinal metaplasia. The top two images on the left are of normal antrum and normal body. And you can really see quite dramatically in the bottom two pictures uh, the uh, features of intestinal metaplasia. You can see first most prominently a blueness to these lesions. We call that the light blue crest sign, which is believed to represent the um, brush border uh, on narrowband imaging. You can see villus type mucosa. You can see a ridge sign. You can see prominent um, raised or depressed lesions. So really, if you know what to look for, these should be very obvious. And this was confirmed by a very nice study by Dr. Buxbaum and others at USC on the right, where they recruited 112 patients in a prospective repeated measures design. And they had basically two endoscopists do the exact same endoscopy, one with white light, conventional white light, and one with narrowband imaging. And they compared that with the gold standard of uh, Sydney protocol mapping biopsies. And both at the patient level and at the lesion level, the, your sensitivity for detection of intestinal metaplasia was nearly doubled with NBI. So really critical that we be using virtual chromoendoscopy to detect and stage patients with intestinal metaplasia. 
Just a couple of additional images from my, my own practice. So these are two patients uh, with, uh, on the top from, uh, imaged at first with conventional white light endoscopy. And if you squint really hard, you can kind of make out maybe a little bit of erythema and redness um, in, the, in these areas, maybe a little bit of villus-like uh, tissue, maybe a little bit of um, raised character to these tissues. But once you flip on that virtual chromoendoscopy filter, it becomes very, very apparent that uh, there is, uh, there's intestinal metaplasia here. You can see the light blue crest sign. You can see um, the raised lesions on the right. You can see villus-type mucosa on the left. So really, we need to be training uh, Western endoscopists to be using NBI exam, uh, virtual chromoendoscopy for um, all exam examinations of the stomach. And this is also, I think, a topic that is very interesting um, given the advances recently in artificial intelligence and imaging, and so this is a topic that um, we're going to hear about a little bit later uh, uh, tomorrow, actually, <clears throat> from Dr. Tomizawa. Uh, so one more public service announcement is uh, the I new ICD codes. They're actually not new. They, we've had these new ICD codes since October of 2021. I wanted to thank Dr. Camargo, Ms. Naramore from the AGA, uh, Dr. Patty Garcia from Stanford, and Dr. Uh, Piazuelo from Vanderbilt for helping uh, Juha and I um, submit and get these uh, codes approved by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Um, so this was a years-long process. Um, we were quite shocked back in 2018, 2019 that there weren't existing codes. And so we um, worked with the AGA to submit a body of codes, the K31.A family of codes. So we roughly structured these based on the existing Barrett's esophagus codes. Uh, so the highest level division is between dysplasia and non-dysplastic IM. So the K31.A1 family are, is IM without dysplasia, and then that um, is further stratified by anatomical location, and then the K31.A2 is intestinal metaplasia with dysplasia. The codes aren't perfect. We didn't, we weren't able to include um, additional histologic details like complete versus incomplete, severity. <clears throat> OGIM scoring, but certainly better than uh, not having anything. And there was a real emphasis uh, from the committee on um, creating a parsimonious set of codes. So we thought that, that this set of codes was um, the right balance between uh, granularity and parsimony. Notably, these codes are only available in the, in the United States as they were, um, they were codified in IC10CM, which stands for clinical modification. So these codes are actually not available outside of the, the United States currently. And the other thing to note is that these codes will actually not automatically be carried over for ICD-11, which was promulgated just last year. So if anybody in the audience uh, feels strongly and wants to be a champion to uh, carry these codes on to ICD-11 and wor work with the World Health Organization on this, um, then we, we would fully support you. <clears throat> So we've had two wonderful gastric cancer summits, the 2020 Gastric Cancer Summit, um, which was the last summit before the pandemic shut the world down, and then the uh, 2022 Gastric Cancer Summit. So I thought what would be most helpful today is if I provided some updates on some interesting, relevant um, papers in the last two years since our last summit with regards to intestinal metaplasia. So I wanted to pr present a couple of um, interesting scientific papers uh, since that time. The first is a set of studies published by Monica Laskowska, uh, Anne Hain, and Duco Mulder. Um, and so what th this group did is that they performed a very large global systematic review and meta-analysis. They looked at over 500 paper papers, nearly a million patients of patients with precursor lesions, atrophic gastritis, and intestinal metaplasia from all regions around the world. And they had two real questions that they were asking here. The first is, does the prevalence of precursor lesions vary by region of the world, by the cancer incidence of, uh, of a country? And then the second question they wanted to ask is, then does the progression from IM to cancer also vary by region of the world or by regional cancer incidence? So the answer to the first is, was, is in their first paper on the left here. And what they found, perhaps not surprisingly, was that the prevalence of IM and other precursors did vary dramatically by regions of the world. So going from low to medium to high cancer incidence nations, you can see a clear association with both the prevalence of atrophic gastritis as well as intestinal metaplasia that's seen on, on the top row there. And in the bottom figure, in the uh, bottom row, you can see that when 
graphing the prevalence of Helicobacter pylori in a nation against the prevalence of these precursor lesions, there's again a very, very clear uh, association. So it does seem that there is um, that there is a higher prevalence of precursors in regions of the world with higher gastric cancer incidence, higher Helicobacter pylori uh, prevalence. Perhaps not not so that surprising, but a, a very important finding nonetheless. But the really kind of interesting finding, I think, is the second paper that they published on uh, on the right, which they looked at the progression from IM to cancer based on the cancer incidence. And so among low incidence countries, they found a pooled progression rate of about 2.4 per 1,000 person years. But in high incidence countries, this rate was very similar at 2.9 per 1,000 person years. So I think collectively what these two papers show is that the difference in intestinal type gastric cancer that we see between different regions of the world, different countries of the world, is really driven by the prevalence and not by differential rates of progression. And I think the AGA guidelines in 2020 hinted at this, that there isn't really good data that once you have intestinal metaplasia, it doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter what other demographic features you have. Once you have intestinal metaplasia, um, your, your risk may be similar to everyone else who has intestinal metaplasia. So I thought that this, these two studies uh, really nicely <clears throat> articulated that point. <clears throat> The second pair of complementary studies I wanted to talk about, uh, which were published by members of the audience today, were are the um, the uh, OGM cl clinical cl risk gratification system. So OGA and OGM have been around for 15, 10 to 15 years now, but we're just now beginning to uh, get that good long-term, um, well-powered cohort data showing that. OGM in particular, more, perhaps more than OGA, can really effectively risk stratify patients with intestinal metaplasia. So I wanted to highlight these two. Um, the first is by Dr. Yeo and colleagues from Singapore. Um, this is based on the Singaporean GCEP study, where the, uh, 2,980 Chinese Singaporean patients were followed with three and five year endoscopies. And <clears throat> the investigators recorded 21 cases of neoplasia, which were defined as cancer uh, or high grade dysplasia. And when stratified by histologic status at baseline, you can see a very, very nice association. As you go up the OGM stage, your cancer risk increases dramatically. The difference in risk between an OGM 3 and 4 versus an OGM 1 is nearly 20-fold. <clears throat> a complementary study to this was published by Dr. Enola Raquelme, Shalja Shal, and others um, based on the Chilean ECHO study. Um, and so in this study, they followed 685 Chilean adults with serial endoscopies with a median follow-up time of three years. And in this case, 11 cases of neoplasia, also de uh, defined as cancer or high-grade dysplasia, were detected. And again, stratified by OGM status at uh, the time of cohort entry, a very, very nice and clear association with high OGM status, especially OGMs three and four, with the risk of subsequent uh, neoplasia. Speaking of OGM uh, and OGA, I wanted to also mention this very nice systematic review, which was published this year in GUT. So this was, interestingly, a systematic review of all national guidelines and consensus statements between 2010 and 2023. And I think several members of the audience are on this, uh, on this manuscript as well. And so a couple of points here. The first thing is that there is a heterogeneity in guidelines across the world. That's expected. But I think there's really this emerging consensus of who to screen and whom not to screen, uh, wh whom to survey and whom not to survey. And really, these patients with very low risk features, your antrum restricted, focal intestinal, focal intestinal metaplasia with no other risk factors, really across the world, I think the guidelines and consens consensus statements are fairly unified in that these patients do not need routine surveillance. The other thing that I think is coming, that is becoming consensus is that you must use histology to risk stratify the population. In some cases, it might be extension to corpus versus um, uh, uh, restricted to antrum. It could be OGM stage. <coughs> it could be histology, <coughs> incomplete subtype. Um, but <coughs> some way or another, there has to be some incorporation of that histologic data into the decision to stratify. And I think this is where the United States is behind. Our pathologists do not routinely um, use OGA or OGIM. Our 
endoscopists do not routinely take Sydney protocol biopsies. So I think this is a real opportunity for improvement. And hopefully with the new ACG guidelines, with doc, uh, which Dr. Morgan will be talking about later today, we're going to hear about um, some of the efforts to improve uh, this in the United States. So the final um, uh, set of papers I wanted to talk about uh, are actually biological in nature. Um, which uh, reveals an enhanced understanding of the cellular origins of intestinal metaplasia and neoplasia uh, via single cell and spatial profiling. So I wanted to first highlight uh, the study on the left is from Patrick Tan's group. This was based on, uh, in Singapore, this was based on the Singapore and GCEP study. So there have been really uh, marked advances in uh, both single cell and spatial sequencing um, over the last five uh, years, which have allowed us to really develop a characterization and an understanding at the cellular and the molecular level of intestinal metaplasia, which was not previously feasible. And what the a group in Singapore did was that they took patients with moderate and severe intestinal metaplasia, and they subjected the uh, samples to single cell sequencing. And what they're finding is that intestinal metaplasia is not a monolithic lesion. Rather, it is composed of two distinct populations of cells both mature cells, such as enterocytes and goblet cells, but also a population of immature cells, which we may even call stem cells, which are characterized by the expression of Olfin-4. And so these two distinct populations of cells within an intestinal metaplasia uh, may convey differences in cancer risk. So what they did using spatial uh, transcriptomics is that they took slides where there was intestinal metaplasia and cancer in the same slide, and they looked at this uh, expression profiling of the intestinal stem cells, the mature enterocytes, and the gastric cancer. And what they found was that the expression profile of the stem cells was much, much more similar to cancer than it was to the enterocytes. So this would suggest that perhaps it really is the stem cells here that are the culprit. The study on the right, um, uh, we have currently in preprint form. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Wickman, uh, uh, my co-author on this study. And in this study, we, uh, using the Stanford Biorepository, we developed a signature of 26 genes which defined and characterized intestinal metaplasia. You can see uh, on the top figure here a spatial transcriptomic slide showing that it very well captures the metaplastic glands. And similar to the Singaporean study, we found that there was two distinct populations of cells here. There was intest uh, differentiated intestinal cells composed of enterocytes and goblet cells. And we also found various lineages of dedifferentiated immature cells, which we also called intestinal stem cells. Building on that, we used single molecule fluorescence in situ hybridization to show by developing markers for either stem cells or mature cells that these two cell populations actually localize to, to completely different compartments within a metaplastic foci. So I think what these two studies show is that really the goblet cells that we, we're seeing uh, on the microscope, they may not be the real culprit here because they're terminally differentiated cells. They might rather just represent underlying damage, and it's really these intestinal, intestinalized stem cells that are the real cause of cancer. <clears throat> so in terms of remaining gaps, I think defining optimal intervals for surveillance uh, is something that we can do much better on. Uh, most of the current intervals we have are based on expert opinion, and we need better stratified incidence data from low incidence Western nations, and hopefully we can incorporate biomarkers into this as well. The risk stratification of asymptom asymptomatic in individuals, I think, is a major topic as well. Everything we're talking about are for patients with known intestinal metaplasia, but we estimate that probably 90% of patients in the United States with intestinal metaplasia don't even know they have it. So what patients do we need to be screening for intestinal metaplasia? And finally, from a quality improvement standpoint, how can we improve in awareness and detection of IM among Western endoscopists? How can we increase the use of NBI? and Sydney system biopsies among gastroenterologists, and how can we encourage the use of OLGA and OLGIM scoring among Western pathologists? Thank you very much. <clears throat>